Okay. Hello. I'm Jane Clark with the library, and on behalf of the library, I want to welcome you all here this evening. I'm absolutely thrilled with the turnout for Ted Conover, and I know we're in for a wonderful, wonderful evening. Before I introduce Mr. Conover, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Second Story Book Company for being here tonight and having Mr. Conover's books available. And of course, he will be signing them after the program. And also, we have with us C-SPAN 2 this evening. So you'll have the opportunity, if you have cable, to see a recording of this, a video of this, probably in two or three weeks, either on a Saturday or Sunday morning. I don't quite know what the schedule is, but when I find out, you certainly may call me at extension 316, and I will certainly let you know. Or you can read the byline if you like. Um, I don't think I have anything further to announce, except to say that Mr. Conover, his name crossed my path about, oh, three or four months ago. As someone who was writing a book, and you know, I thought, well, Sing Sing, of course it would be of interest to people. What I forgot was that this is the 175th birthday of this institution. And I think we all know that Sing Sing is sort of a hot topic, shall we say? We know that there is in the works a proposed museum, a Sing Sing Museum, and whenever we have a program on this topic, we always fill the house. The next time we're going to go either down to the main reading room, or maybe this is a wonderful excuse for a new library. <laughs> yes, in any event, welcome again, and let me introduce to you Mr. Ted Conover, the author of New Jack, Guarding Sing Sing. Thank you all very, very much for coming, uh, especially on such a rainy night, especially when it's so hard to park, especially when it's so hard to sit down. Uh, I'm kind of relieved you didn't come to hear me. You came because of Sing Sing, and that takes a lot of pressure off me. Uh, this book has been a kind of a long project. I've been uh, interested in prisons for a long time, and in particular interested in the role of uh, of officers in prison, correctional officers, or guards as they used to be called, and uh, got started on this subject back in 93 actually when I approached the, uh, what was then the state uh, CO's union, Council 82 up in Albany, because I thought of everything we know or think we know about prisons from television and movies and other books, uh, it seemed to me the, the the biggest stereotype and probably the biggest misunderstanding was uh, was that of, of guards or COs who uh, are such an easy bad guy in the movie uh, in the movies uh, you know in almost every prison movie up to the Green Mile in fact uh, guards are portrayed as basically 250 pounds of brutal white meat uh, just waiting to raise their clubs against inmates and I thought that was probably uh, not the whole story, or perhaps not even any of the story. And I thought I would talk to some officers and, and see what I could learn about the work and the job. And uh, uh, I did so. But as I did, I uh, felt strongly that, as is the case with certain occupations, there is a, uh, an official story. And then there's there's the real story, and I also thought this was this was a subject that uh, you might only be able to understand if uh, if you put on the uniform and tried for at least a while to see what it felt like to be inside prison every day as a job, uh, not you know to to go where others are sent is one way you might put it uh, to feel the uh, gates locked behind you and emerge at the end of the day uh, maybe a little different than you went in. So I applied for a job with the state. I actually had been told I, I couldn't visit the uh, training academy, which I had wanted to do as a journalist. I thought that would be 
a great place to see where the, the values of the profession are first imparted. Uh, you know, watch some recruits come into the system. They said no. Uh, we would don't let anybody uh, besides recruits into there. And that didn't seem to me right. I don't, I don't know um, about a lot of you, but the sight of a big prison wall just uh, incites in me huge curiosity. All I want to do is see what's behind it. Uh, nothing, I think, uh, stimulates the imagination like, like a wall, as strange as that is, as it may seem. And so I applied for the job, like anybody else. Uh, I told the truth on my application. It took a while to get hired, about three years, I think. Somehow I passed the psychological tests. Um, and I uh, showed up one night a lot like this, one Sunday night in 1997 at the Albany Training Academy, which is where all the officers, uh, who, well, I'm not sure all the officers, but certainly most of the more recent officers at Sing Sing, many of whom are here tonight, and I uh, appreciate that. Uh, uh, it's where the careers begin. And it's basically a boot camp. You're there to learn the rules and regs. You're there to learn firearms and chemical agents. Don't call it tear gas or you'll have to do 20 push-ups. And, uh, and also you're there to learn the sort of off-the-record stuff, the unofficial stuff that uh, real people know who do a real job. After seven weeks at the academy, uh, often, not always, but often uh, the new recruits are assigned to Sing Sing because of all uh, when I went through anyway, of all the prisons in the state, Sing Sing had the greatest constant need for new officers. It's expensive to live down here relative to other parts of New York State. And uh, there are other reasons involved. Uh, a lot of the officer corps is, uh, are white men uh, who wish to prefer, wish to return to the towns where they grew up, uh, often towns where there are prisons nearby that allow them to uh, uh, stay somewhere near home. And so Sing Sing gets a lot of prisoners, a lot of prisoners, a lot of officers uh, who are just passing through and who put in their application for transfer the day they arrive. Uh, but, but I was one of a few, I only knew about four others who, who did not put in the application to transfer. I live in the Bronx and I thought uh, this was just where I wanted to be. It's uh, famous, it's old, it's been here forever. It seemed, according to reputation, rougher than other maximum security prisons in the state, though you can never tell what these rumors mean until you uh, actually land in a place and see for yourself. And I thought this is uh, where I would stay for uh, as long as I could. So uh, I became a new Jack. And that's uh, a phrase I don't think they've got in every prison everywhere, but uh, certainly in some New York State prisons, a new jack is a rookie officer. Now and then, it, it can refer to a rookie inmate, too. Uh, there are a lot of new people in prison all the time, and everybody finds it a lot to get used to, a lot to learn about. And what I'd like to do for the next 15 minutes is read to you from the very short first chapter of New Jack, a passage that describes me arriving at work. Uh, this would have been about my third day, excuse me, my third week on the job, and trying to describe how it felt, because uh, there are lots of policy books about prisons, uh, lots of people trying to figure out what to do with the, the problem we have of so many inmates and such a huge expense, such long sentences, uh, a prison complex nationwide that far exceeds what other industrialized countries seem to find uh, necessary or appropriate. I wanted to describe this from my point of view, frankly, uh, which in, in many ways I think is, is that of any new officer at Sing Sing. Now a lot of you know about the prison uh, because you're from around here, but it seems to me it's also very possible to be around here and know almost nothing because the prison does not invite people in very often. and. Uh, and I think that's a mistake. I've, I've got to say, too, what I hope uh, you'll agree justifies uh, the kind of research I did for my book is the fact that uh, uh, I think prisons are too secretive. I think 
uh, somehow departments of correction get a little too scared uh, that public exposure will result in ridicule or some kind of uh, condemnation. And I think as a result, a lot of people think worse things about prisons than, than are true. Certainly it leaves too much to the imagination to keep everybody out and, uh, and to remain tight-lipped about the difficulty of the work. Uh, first chapter, Inside Passage. 6.20 a.m., and the sun rises over a dark place. Across the Hudson River from Sing Sing Prison, on the opposite bank, the hills turn pink. I spot the treeless gap in the ridge line where, another officer has told me, inmates quarried marble for the first cell block. Nobody could believe it back in 1826. A work crew of convicts camping on the river bank actually induced to build their own prison. They'd been sent down from Auburn, New York State's famous second prison, to construct Sing Sing, its third. How would that feel? building your own prison. The shell of that 1826 cell block still stands on the other side of the high wall I park against. The prison has continued to grow all around it. In 1984, the roof burned down. At the time, the prison was using the building as a shop to manufacture plastic garbage bags. But as late as 1943, it still housed inmates. Sometimes now, when inmates complain about their six by nine cells, I tell them how it used to be. Two men sharing a three and a half by seven foot cell, one of them probably with TB, no central heating or plumbing, open sewer channels inside, little light. They look unimpressed. I park next to my friend Aragon of the Bronx, who always puts the club on his steering wheel. I see it through his tinted glass. This interests me because with a heavily armed wall tower just a few yards away, this has got to be one of the safest places to leave your car in Westchester <laughs> County. Nobody's going to steal it here. But Aragon's a little lock crazy. He's screwed a tiny hasp onto his plastic lunchbox and hangs a combination lock there because of the sodas he's lost to pilfering officers, he says. <laughs> this happens every day. <laughs> Between the Bronx and prison, a, a person could grow a bit lock obsessed. There's no one else around. Most people park in the lots up the hill, nearer the big locker room in the administration building. But it's almost impossible for a new officer to get a locker in there. So I park down here by the river in the lower locker room. The light is dim. Gravel crunches under my boots as I head into the abandoned heating plant. This six-story brick structure is one of those piles of slag that gives Sing Sing its particular feel. Massive, tan, and almost windowless, it looks like a hangar for a short, fat rocket. The whole thing is sealed off except for a repair garage around the corner and a part of the first floor containing men's and women's locker rooms and restrooms. The men's locker room, I've never seen the women's, is itself nearly abandoned, though it's stuffed with a hodgepodge of some 200 lockers of inmate manufacture, fewer than 20 are actively used. The rest have locks on them, some very ancient indeed, belonging to officers who quit or transferred or died or who knows what. Nobody keeps track. An old wall phone hangs upside down by its wires on the left as you enter, the receiver dangling by its curly cord, a symbol of Sing Sing's chronically broken phone system, which I've heard has been improved lately. <laughs> Parts of this will be outdated. <coughs> Cobwebs in here find a way onto your boots. For a few weeks following my arrival, on Aragon's advice, I checked the room for lockers that might have opened up. None ever did. All those unused lockers needlessly tied up. This might not be a problem for the officers who drive to work from the north, but down south in the Bronx, I live there too, you don't want to advertise that you're a correction officer. Too many people around you, <clears throat> excuse me, have been in prison. Officers tend not to stick the big badge decals they pass out at the academy on their car windows because they like their windows. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and most, like me, don't want to walk the street wearing a uniform. It's just awkward. A, a locker lets you leave your uniform at work. My second month, I found one old lock that was so flimsy I could almost twist it off with my hands, but not quite. I brought in a small tire iron and it came off easily. I can't get in trouble for this anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> Inside were plastic cups, magazine pictures of women in bikinis, and newspapers from 1983. I've since heard of a locker coming available in the administration building, but I'm not pursuing it. I've come to prefer it down here. The feel of neglect is somehow truer to the spirit of Sing Sing. It's barely 15 minutes till lineup. I throw on my gray polyester uniform, making sure I've got all the things I need on my belt, 
radio holder, latex glove packet, two key ring clips, baton ring. I put pen and pad, inmate rule book, and blue union diary in my breast pockets, slide my baton through the ring, lock the padlock, and slam the locker door. I walk past a pile of old office desks and, by necessity, into the men's room. It smells like an outhouse. I sit down for the second time this morning. Every morning's like this, and it is for the other new guys, too. Your stomach lets you know, just before the shift starts, what it thinks of this job. A decrepit footbridge takes me over the tracks of the Metro North Railroad. Sing Sing may be the only prison anywhere with a commuter railroad running through it. <laughs> and other officers start to appear. My climb continues up a wooden staircase that's been built atop a crumbling concrete one. Here is the administration building parking lot and the main entrance to the prison. Parked in the middle is the roach coach, purveyor of coffee and rolls. To the right is the entrance to the visit room, not yet open. To the left, officers are lined up, waiting to deposit their handguns at the outside window of the arsenal. For reasons lost to time, New York State Correction officers are allowed to own and carry concealed weapons, and most seem to enjoy doing so. However, they can't bring the guns inside with them. Nobody's allowed to carry inside, and few of us have any doubt that prison is the safer for it. I take the last steps to the main gate and flash the badge and ID card I carry in a special wallet that I picked up at the academy. The officer takes a cursory check inside my lunch bag, the contraband check. I punch my time card and proceed to the morning's worst assignment, morning's worst moment, getting my assignment. The desk of Sergeant Ed Holmes is the focal point of the lineup room. It's on a raised platform in front of a window. From up there, Holmes can see everybody in the room and most of those ascending the front steps. His eyes are constantly scanning, never settling on any person or object for more than an instant moving from an officer to the printout in front of him and back again. The printout tells him what jobs he'll need to fill, who's on his day off, who's got vacation, who's out sick, who's on suspension. He checks off old timers as he sees them. They've chosen their jobs and know where they're going. It's the new guys like me who are at his mercy. Holmes is one of the tough black officers who've been here forever, a big man who seems to enjoy his distance from the rank and file. Several of his fellow white shirts spoke to us during orientation, mostly about how the institution runs. Holmes was different. He came only to warn. Don't fuck with me, he said, glancing at the back wall of the room. I'm going to give you your job assignment, and if you complain, I'll give you a worse one tomorrow. I have no patience. I'm not nice. Don't fuck with me. <laughs> a few days later, a longtime officer advised me never to show Holmes I was scared of him or anything else. Holmes feeds on weakness, she said. <laughs> and now the line has moved and I'm next, a small new officer before the mighty sergeant. I place my time card in front of him. He initials all the cards to prevent us from uh, punching in for our friends, and then he's uncharacteristically silent. Holmes hasn't decided what to do with me. Or maybe he's not thinking of me at all. Maybe his mind has wandered to his car or his electric bill or the movie he watched on TV last night. He riffles through his printout. Usually I'm sent to A block or B block. These are massive human warehouses, two of the largest prison housing units in the world, containing over a thousand inmates between them. I live for the exceptions, an easy day in the wall tower, the barber shop, or the hospital. That's the root of my dread, the hope for something else. 254, B block, says Holmes finally, glancing to my left. Holmes could tell us the job instead of just the number, but if it's in the blocks, he won't. He wants to leave us guessing, as if we're still at the academy. I walk and turn back among the 80-odd officers milling around the crowded room, looking for someone who might know what job 254 is. I ask Miller. He shrugs. I ask Eves. He thinks it's an escort job. That would be good. Escort officers spend a while in the mess hall and then get to leave the block for chunks of the day, taking groups of inmates to other buildings in the prison. Eves has written down all the jobs in his union diary, but hasn't yet found the number when a different sergeant shouts, on the lineup. As we assemble in rows, I pray it's true that it's an escort job and not a gallery job. Gallery officers run the galleries, the floors on which inmates live. Galleries are understaffed, and the officers on them, surrounded by inmates all day, are put at risk and run ragged. It's an awful job. I often get it. <laughs> We form into six or seven files facing the white shirts, most of whom are sergeants. 
As we're called to attention, it's interesting to watch the fat ones try to squeeze between our narrow rows as they make a cursory check for violations of uniform. Missing collar brass, whiskers, an earring inadvertently left in. Then a lieutenant, often the watch commander, speaks, telling us what's gone on in the prison since we left the day before. Today it's Lieutenant Gowie. I'm not going to try my Lieutenant Gowie impression tonight because um, too many people in here know him. <laughs> you retired? Ah, oh, well then. Uh. <laughs> okay, it's been pretty quiet. They had one guy cut in the leg in the tunnel from A Block Yard. No weapon, no perp, the usual. Then we found three shanks buried in the dirt there in B Block Yard. Two of them metal that we found with metal detectors. You think they're just sitting around out there, but these crooks are always conniving. In other words, one inmate stabbed, assailant unknown, knife not found, three homemade knives found, no officers hurt. A fairly typical day. Then a new sergeant steps forward. Remember, there's no double clothing allowed during rec for the obvious reasons. Inmates with two shirts on or two sets of pants should be sent back to their cells and not allowed in the yard or gym. Double clothing is understood to be both a defense against getting stuck and a way of quickly changing your appearance if you stick someone else. Often we'll hear a moral message at line up too, a warning that we're not stepping up to the inmates enough, or a caution that we need to watch one another's backs better and know the names of the people we're working with, or a reminder that our job is to get out of here in one piece at 3 p.m., as if that needed saying. No such message today. There's a schedule of driver's ed courses for anyone interested, and a reminder of next week's blood drive, and then the announcements are over. Officers, attention, yells the sergeant. Everyone's quiet. Posts. And we're off, not exactly at a run, through the long, rough corridors and up the hill to begin the day. Sing Sing sprawls over 55 acres, most of it rocky hillside. It's flat down where I park, near the river, the old cell block and the railroad tracks. The former death house, site of the electric chair that killed 614 inmates between 1891 and 1963 is down there too. It's now a vocational training building. And so is Tap N, the medium security uni unit of Sing Sing, with some 550 inmates housed in three 1970s vintage shoebox shaped buildings. But most of Sing Sing is on the hill, and from the lineup room, we climb there. Getting to B Block is the longest walk. It's the remotest part of the Max Jail. There are a couple of ways to go. Both involve a lot of stairs. Officers sip from coffee cups and swing lunch bags as we make the slow march up to work. We are black and white and Latino, male and female. Members of the skeleton night crew pass us in the hall and wave wanly. Most have that gray night shift look. They trade normal diurnal rhythms for the perk of having very little inmate contact. At night, all the inmates are locked in their cells. If I didn't have a family, I might put in for night duty. The corridors and stairways are old, often in disrepair. When it rains, we skirt puddles from leaking roofs. When it's cold, we have reason to remember that the passages are unheated. The tunnels snake around Sing Sing, joining the various buildings. And at the beginning and end of each, sometimes even in the middle, there's a locked gate. Most of the officers posted to these gates have big, thick keys but at one gate, the guard pushes buttons instead, as they do in modern prisons. By the time I pass through the heavy front door of B Block, there are ten locked gates between me and freedom. A Block and B Block are the most impressive buildings in Sing Sing, and in a totally negative sense. A large cathedral will inspire awe. A large cell block, in my experience, will mainly horrify. The size of the buildings catches the first-time visitor by surprise, and that's largely because there's no preamble. Instead of approaching them from a wide staircase or through an arched gate, you pass from an enclosed corridor through a pair of solid metal doors, neither one much bigger than your front door at home, and enter into a stupefying vastness. A block, probably the largest freestanding cell block in the world, I could never make absolute sure of that, is 588 feet long, 12 feet shy of the length of two football fields. It houses some 684 inmates, more than the entire population of many prisons. You can hear them, an encompassing, overwhelming cacophony of radios, of heavy gate slamming, of shouts and whistles and running footsteps, but oddly at first you can't see a single incarcerated soul. 
All you see are the bars that form the narrow fronts of their cells, extending four stories up and so far into the distance on the left and right that they melt into an illusion of solidity. And when you start walking down the gallery, 88 cells long, and begin to make eye contact with inmates, one after another after another, some glaring, some dozing, some sitting bored on the toilet, a sense grows of the human dimensions of this colony. Ahead of you may be a half dozen small mirrors held through the bars by dark arms. These retract as you draw even, and you and the inmate get a brief but direct look at each other. A block and B block are aligned with each other end to end and span the top of Sing Sing. Between them sits the mess hall building. Both were completed in 1929 and they're very similar in structure, except B block is 20 cells shorter, 68, and one story taller, five. Though few civilians have seen anything like them, there's nothing architecturally innovative about the design. It plainly derives from the 1826 cell block, based on Auburn's new north wing, which was the prototype for most American cell house construction. Tiny cells back to back on five tiers with a stairway at either end and one in the center of the very long range. From the ground floor, which in both buildings is known as the flats, you know, I'm going to skip this paragraph because uh, I don't want you to get too hot and impatient back there. I feel badly for the people standing. The blocks are loud because they're hard. There's nothing inside them to absorb sound except the inmates' thin mattresses and their bodies. Every other surface is of metal or concrete or brick. A crowd of officers is milling around a cell near the front gate of B block when I get there. This cell is the office of the officer in charge, or OIC. Rooms for staff were not included in B block's plan, so a few cells near the front gate have been converted for that purpose. Next to the OIC's office, an identical tiny cell houses the sergeants. Two of them are squeezed in there. Next to that is the coat room, which contains a barely functioning microwave oven and a refrigerator that won't stay closed. There's an office for paperwork and filling out forms and one for a toilet, the only staff toilet on these five floors. For many years, the day shift OIC has been Hattie Mama Cradle, a 50-something woman five feet tall and just about as big around. She's got a clipboard in her hand and horn-rimmed reading specs on a chain around her neck. Officers give her their names and numbers. She tells them where they're posted. I hang back a little, but then there's no more stalling. Conover, 254, I say. She gets the spelling off the tag on my shirt, then, already poised to jot down the next name, says, R and W. My heart sinks. It's as bad as it could be. I'm the first officer on the second floor galleries, known by the letters R and W. I've worked there a few times before, including my very first horrifying day of on-the-job training, when I accompanied a novice officer in New Jack who barely knew what he was doing. Today, I'm that New Jack, going it alone. I crowd into Cradle's office and look for my keys, four separate rings of the big heavy bit keys, which work cell doors, with center gate, end gate, and fire alarm keys thrown on for good measure. I attach these to my belt and feel the weight. My heart's pounding, but there's nothing for it. I find a fresh battery for the floor's portable communications radio and grab a sheaf of forms that I have to fill out during my shift. Last is the list of keep locks. I copy mine from Cradle's bulletin board, noting that there are two new ones in the past 24 hours. Keep locks are inmates on disciplinary restriction. In the old days, there were few such inmates, and often they'd be sent to solitary confinement, known as the special housing unit, or the box. But now their numbers overwhelm the box, so they stay put, mixed in with the general population, except that they can't come out of their cells. One of our main responsibilities as gallery officers is to keep the keep locks locked up. But because we're always in a hurry and often don't know the inmates, this is harder than it sounds. It's easy to unlock the wrong door. I pass through two more gates on my way upstairs and relieve the night officer on R&W. Since the galleries are all locked down at night, mainly her job is to check every 15 minutes or, excuse me, every hour or so that every inmate is still breathing. It's not a bad job, and if an inmate does die, it's no problem, unless he's found with rigor mortis. In that case, she will lose her job because of the cold, hard proof that she wasn't really checking. The night officer hands, that's true, the night officer hands me the radio and some other keys. Does she know what the new key blocks are in for, I ask? I don't know, I don't care, they're not my friends, and I don't like them, she says. 
with a suddenness and finality that I find kind of funny. She hands me the radio, which I attach to my belt. She's left some wrappers and tissues around the desktop, but I don't mention it. She looks tired. I envy her as she puts on her coat. She's going home and doesn't have to deal with the inmates any longer. The cells are all deadlocked, she adds before leaving, which means that not only is the huge bar or break in place, which locks them all at once, but the cells are locked individually. Inmates are not at large at night, swarming around you on their way to chow, arguing with you when it's time to lock in, calling you names, stressing you out. Pandora's box is closed. My first job of the day, with breakfast less than an hour away, will be to open it. Thanks. I found that one of the... I found that one of the things that surprises uh, my friends most about prison work is how the inmates are not in their cells all day long, but in fact come out and go back constantly. Every time uh, there's a meal in prison, all the inmates except the keep locks come out, go to the mess hall, and then are sent back to their cells where the gallery officer has to get them back in. And uh, my very first day in B block, I said to the, this other new Jack, well, how do you get them back in? <laughs> it seemed a reasonable question because there are about 60 people out of their cells on each side of the floor. And he said, oh, you just tell them. And I thought, wow, this is going to be amazing. And, uh, and I'd heard uh, officers upstairs yelling, gentlemen, step in, step in, gentlemen. And like, you know, like they're working in an English pub or something. <laughs> Gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, but that's what I did. I yelled, gentlemen, step in, and uh, it was like a miracle. About half of them stepped in. <laughs> but then comes the hard part, which is the guys who won't step in. And, uh, and this is the hard thing about prison work, is the, the gray area, the fact they're supposed to step in within two minutes or something, but what's going to happen if I stay out another minute or two? I mean, with all these guys out, what's going to happen to me? And a lot of inmates uh, spend a lot of their days trying to reset, re tip the balance of power with officers in their favor. Uh, because though officers do run Sing Sing, as uh, Sergeant Bloom up at the academy uh, said to us, uh, we do it with the inmates' consent. This, this, this was a an idea not all officers agree with. In fact, the next officer to walk into the room when Sergeant Bloom left told us he was full of you-know-what. Uh, he said, I don't know where he worked, but where I work, we run the jail. I think the truth, as any officer will tell you, is um, there are times all day long when inmates could overpower a given group of officers if they were so organized and, and so upset. Uh, that's why there's so many gates in prison. It keeps the areas where that can happen small so that uh, a bunch of inmates could not overcome a whole lot of officers. But still, prison's a scary place because as an officer, you are constantly outnumbered. You don't have a firearm. And if you are in the mess hall when the big fight breaks out, uh, the officers at the gate are going to lock the door with you in there. <clears throat> because that's what's going to keep the rest of the prison safe. And w you're told that at the academy, and as you step into the mess room, as I stepped in, I always thought about that. Uh, and thought about uh, that worst case scenario. Uh, it never happened to me. Uh, thank God. I worked with uh, uh, people it had happened to. Uh, prison is full of very uh, brave workers. There are many correction officers who've had a very hard time of it, who've been slugged, who've been in a lot of fights, and, and who somehow get back on the horse and, and go to work again and again. Um, I was slugged on the one day when I lost my temper, and this seems to me just a perfect story to illustrate what it, th that very crucial relationship between inmates and officers. You say things like, gentlemen, because you're not going to call them, you're not going to say, step in, you crooks. You're not, inmates are very sensitive to disrespect. <laughs> and that sounds funny, but uh, you, if you disrespect an inmate, 
he is going to act like you have insulted his family and, and everyone he's ever known, and he is going to, it's going to become personal between you and him. And that's what you don't want in prison. You don't want it to get personal at all. And that's why you keep a blank face and you try to treat everybody the same, despite the fact they are pointing out how you're treating the Latinos different from the black guys. And you didn't lock him up, CO. It's, uh, it's the hardest and I'm sure the worst job I've ever had and that, that I ever hoped to have. Uh, the day I lost my temper, this inmate in A block was in a row with about five other key blocks. And sometimes when they're locked right next to each other, it sort of concentrates a defiant or angry vibe. And uh, this one inmate was demanding to see a sergeant all day long, which inmates can do. I'd already told the sergeant he didn't want to see the inmate. I told the inmate that. He responded with a uh, profanity and uh, spent the rest, or the next three or four hours of the shift uh, coming up with creative ways to insult me. From the common, commonly used cracker applied to all kinds of new uh, white officers from up north to, um, oh man, you name it. Uh, Forrest Gump, Barney Fife, uh, <laughs> Whoever I remind you of vaguely, inmates have thought of it before you. <laughs> and, uh, and like to amuse themselves by coming up with nicknames for officers. Uh, uh, there was a new Jack, a female officer from upstate, uh, uh, tall with red hair, who had to walk down the gallery partway through the day to, to do the go-round, which is an inmate list of where they're going to be in the afternoon. Again, my friends have a hard time understanding this, how we would have to ask the inmates where we're going, but there are, uh, you know, 50 or 60 inmates per every officer. The inmates' destinations change according to whether they have class on that day, where they, they get to go to the commissary, uh, whether they have a visit coming up, and, and you have to find out where they're going. This officer walked bravely down the gallery shouting, female on the gallery, as every female officer does, so that the guys know to get decent. And as sometimes happens, uh, an inmate chose to take that warning and twist it and was masturbating by the time she arrived. And uh, I just got furious. Like, this sort of thing makes you so angry when you see something bad happen to a nice person. And she came back kind of upset, and we filled out a misbehavior report, which is a ticket an officer can write to lock up an inmate. And I went back, and I just... I kind of yelled at him, which I don't usually do. And then this guy calls me Homer or something as I walk back by, and I just said, why don't you shut up? And boy, that was a mistake. Because uh, the minute you lose your temper, they've, they've won a little battle. And uh, I soon after took his mirror, which he had illegally left on the cell bars, and my next time by, he spit and reached out, and his fist caught me on the side of my head. I wasn't hurt, but uh, I was humiliated. And what's maybe worse is, uh, is one thing that can happen in, in prison work, which is I think if, if this, over time, this sort of interaction makes you feel very badly about inmates. It doesn't happen to all officers, and the best officers uh, preserve their humanity, but it is really easy to start hating some of those guys just as a class of people. And I... You know, I'm liberally educated. I know the inmates are there for all kinds of reasons, some of them beyond their control, perhaps. You cannot blanketly condemn people, but the worst side of prison work is that you get turned against inmates. And that, that I think, is uh, one of the problems, uh, uh, one of the biggest problems we have to deal with uh, in our expanding system, because that's... That's, that's bad. That's, that, that's part of the sh soul-shrinking side of the job that, uh, that you have to be almost superhuman to avoid. Um, I'm going to stop talking now uh, and see if anybody there has any questions uh, I could try to answer uh, or comments. And I'll, I'll start right here with somebody I recognize in the front row. Yeah. Uh, my question is, how did you determine uh, which names in the book you were going to use that were real and which yeah. names? I changed in the book. I changed, uh, I don't know, maybe 50 names, eh, probably less. I list them all at the beginning. I, uh, I felt it was unfair to use the real names of officers who I felt 
uh, might not want to have their real names used. And this is a very subjective judgment. Occasionally, if I described an officer in some kind of conflict, I thought, I'll change his name. He doesn't know I'm, I'm there watching. That's not fair to use his real name. I used real names of people who were uh, not acting in a way that seemed to me negative in any way at all. And, uh, and I hope I did that uh, fairly. If, uh, if you think I made any mistakes, let me know. Uh, but I, I, I did have a concern for the privacy of officers who uh, might not want to see themselves portrayed to the outside world uh, as, as I portrayed them. Uh, right here in the front. I had a comment. I myself was employed for a short period of time at Sing Sing as a civilian worker. Uh -huh. And I found that I didn't go to a training academy. I had three days of orientation. I was given a book. I was told that I'm supposed to write inmates up if they misbehave or if they act inappropriately. I also was told that I was supposed to treat them with respect and dignity. I also was told that I was basically a liability as far as the Department of Corrections was concerned because I was a black female. Basically, I was like um, a piece of beef hanging on a rack, that I would be subjected to all kinds of suspicion of inappropriate behavior. They spent two days talking about inappropriate behavior, sexual harassment. There's a lot of problems going on now with those kinds of things happening. I was not prepared in any way, shape, or form to enter Sing Sing. Yeah. Uh, my third day there, we had a complete code blue lockdown. I was locked in the correspondent's office without even access to a bathroom, mm. totally alone, without any kind of preparation, without any kind of knowledge of what was going on. Yeah. I was not allowed to use the telephone. Yeah. Um, uh, no, can people back there hear her? Okay. I. Not really? Okay. I, is there a question? Uh, I just wanted to know, is there some place in your book or is there something in your future where you plan on talking about the civilian workers as well as the officers. Yeah. The question is whether I ever plan to write about the civilian workers in a prison as well as the officers. She says that as a, an African-American female, uh, she was ill-prepared for work in a prison and that the prison wasn't very uh, sympathetic toward her sort of because of who she was. And um, I think, uh, no, I, uh, my book is strictly about officers, but as everyone should know, there are all kinds of uh, civilian workers in a prison, and many of whom are female and come into contact with inmates. And uh, many of those relationships are very stressful on the female. And, uh, uh, and I am not surprised to hear you uh, were treated or sort of addressed suspiciously by the people in charge because prison administrators are very worried about the possibility of inmates seducing female employees. And as crazy or perhaps sexist as that sounds, it does happen. Uh, as far as I know, two women were fired while I was there for inappropriate contact with inmates, uh, two other officers. It, it just it's, it seems like a very strange thing, but it happens. But no, there's another book to be written about uh, people in your situation. Yes, yes, ma'am. You were mentioning about uh, your emotional attitudes towards the inmates. Do they ever have periodic briefings where, you know, officers come together and discuss their problems and yeah. how they're dealing with, you yeah. know, life? I mean, you know, it seems to me otherwise if you just go to the job and just do it and then go home, you're carrying all this luggage around with you. I mean, yeah. do you ever have any... Yeah, the, the question is, is there ever a structured way for officers to sort of... Uh, talk about their emotional response to the job, their feelings, and uh, I don't think so. It's one of the things that made the job very hard. Uh, you know, I had, I had some buddies I worked with who I could talk about things with, and, uh, and the officer's big advice, which uh, every, all of them know, is, is leave it at the gate. Don't, don't take the job home with you, as though that were possible, you know, as though it were really possible to leave it all behind, because... Uh, some days it really gets under your skin and, and, and you hear, you know, you, the biggest mistake you can make with this job is to come home and treat your family like inmates. And, uh, and it happens a lot. And I did not always treat my family as well as I, 
uh, should have. I've, I've uh, mended fences since, I think. But uh, it, it is a very uh, hard job in that way. And as far as I know, people can correct me, there, there are not many structured ways for uh, COs to handle that. Yes, sir, in the middle. Yes, uh, I read your book. Uh, I was impressed with your insights, the research that you've done, and to kind of like quote you from earlier, you've opened up Pandora's box. Now what are you going to do with it? Haha, <laughs> good question. He said, N I've opened up Pandora's box, now what am I going to do with it? I had to make a decision when I wrote the book exa about exactly what book this was going to be. And uh, uh, I didn't want to write a book, as I've said, about how we should reform our prisons. That's, uh, that's a big and complicated question. I am glad to see my book become part of the debate. I'm glad... Uh, uh, to see people interested in prisons who, and people who care about prisons reading my book and finding uh, knowledge about what it's really like in prisons in it. I uh, think of myself as a reformer. I would like to see prisons changed. I think uh, our prison situation in this country is just uh, way out of control, as I said. But uh, uh, I sort of drew the line, you know, it's one of the great challenges when you write a book is deciding how how far it'll spread out. And I wanted to do one thing as well as I could, which is to write about officers. So uh, that was a line I drew for myself. On this side, yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that when you applied for the job, you told the truth. Does that mean you said you were a journalist and you were applying for the job in order to write about it? No, I told the truth insofar. <laughs> oh, good question. <laughs> uh, I told the truth insofar as I said I was a freelance journalist, that I had worked for newspapers, uh, along, as well as many other things, as m uh, many other jobs I'd held. And uh, uh, I did not uh, say it was my intention to write a book about Sing Sing. Did the correction officers you worked with at Sing Sing know? No, they did not. No, they did not. Yes, ma'am. Any reaction from DOCS or OMH, the two big organizations that you write about? Yeah. The question is any reaction from the Department of Correctional Services or the, or the Office of Mental Health? Um, it's funny, a piece of the book came out first in the New Yorker magazine, and uh, they're very big on fact-checking, on making sure all the facts are correct. And when they called the, uh, the department for some help to make sure I had not made mistakes, the department refused to uh, speak with them, saying uh, I had not gone through channels to uh, write this book, so they weren't going to help the book come out. Um, I read yesterday in the Los Angeles Times that they've, they're now taking a different... Uh, attitude, which is that as far as they're concerned, I am a former employee who um, applied for the job, passed the test, performed the job, and then uh, left state service, and like any other former employee, I'm, I'm free to do what I want. So uh, that's the only reaction from uh, the state that I've, that I've had. I've, I've uh, sent a, a book to Commissioner Gord uh, uh, with a return address and phone number and uh, haven't heard back. Uh, and uh, I've, I've got a website and I've gotten, I'd say, about 40 emails so far from uh, correction officers, mainly correction officers uh, in New York State who uh, thank me for writing the first uh, true thing they've read about their, their, their jobs. Uh, Ma'am, in the middle. Uh, about 10 years ago, I read a book by a former prisoner here back in the 40s who did the stained glass windows for the chapel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And he was claiming at the time that most of the problems in the prison are food. After reading your book in, uh, about Waffle Day and Fried Chicken Day, I assume that isn't true anymore. Uh, I, I, get the, I get the feeling now that the, that the various groups and gangs would be the main reason for any problems that arise. Yeah, the, the comment, if you didn't hear it, is that uh, the man who did the stained glass windows, and I think, the, is it the Catholic chapel or the Protestant? Both. 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 Uh, who was an inmate from upstate, as I recall. Uh, pardon me? His, he was from he's New from New York, York City. City. Uh, said in an interview that the biggest problem in prison was the quality of the food. And as I describe in my book, there's plenty of food now. Um, I, it's not always what the inmates want, and you get the sense they've seen it pretty recently, this, uh, the chicken uh, fricassee or whatever. Um, but nobody goes hungry in there, and, and in fact, uh, uh, 
there's more food served at, at every meal than I could ever my, eat myself. And, and, and your other comment is, is whether gangs are now the biggest problem in, in prison life for inmates. And uh, I'd say they're certainly one of them. Gangs certainly are a, a strong force in, in inmate prison life. Uh, and another thing is, you know, uh, a change since the stained glass windows were made is, is uh, mandatory drug sentencing, which has gotten a lot of people some very long sentences uh, for nonviolent crimes that wouldn't have happened before. And that's, that's filling up prisons uh, with a lot of inmates who wouldn't have been there before. He was supposed to be in for life, forging uh -huh. three checks. Yeah, it's an amazing story about those windows. Yes, there. Yes. I was wondering if you could comment about um, the role that racism plays in Sing Sing. Hmm. Well, the question is about the role of racism. Uh, it's something, uh, the racial situation in New York's prisons is, is uh, something that makes the officer's job difficult because most of the officers, over 90% are white and uh, probably 90% of the inmates are, are minority. And I just had so many times when inmates, you know, I'd ask for an ID card and someone would say, oh, you mean my, my South African transit pass? Is that what you want, officer? And I'd say, come on, just give me the ID. But uh, Sing Sing has a different feel from other state prisons where the staff is white and the inmates are minority. Sing Sing has at least half, I believe, a minority staff. And so you don't have the same racial dynamic that you do in a lot of, uh, in most New York state prisons. And in many ways, that's a good thing. In other ways, I, just, I, have, I think that a lot of uh, the non-white officers at Sing Sing have an extra hard time because of the hassle inmates give them uh, for working for the system as a, as a person of color. And uh, that's something I didn't have to deal with. Now, the whole question of sort of systemic racism, you know, I think I, I'm not here to lecture on that. There's something wrong in a society where so many of the inmates are minority, practically all, and, and, and so many officers are white. I mean, there's, that's a problem. That, it, it, feels, it feels bad. I think it feels bad to everybody. And, uh, uh, I'm, you know, I, I think there's racism in prison as well as everywhere else. But, I, you know, I think between officers, I didn't, uh, I didn't feel a lot. And, and uh, you know, but the, race, the gang thing is the main place you see races uh, butting up against each other in prison, like Latino versus African American. Yes, sir, right here. With everything you say about the life of a correction officer sounding undesirable, except for the research for a book, why does somebody want to be a correction officer? Well, the question is why would anyone want to be a CO? If it's as unappetizing as I say, and I think uh, economics is what drives it mainly. I, I think uh, if you need a job with good benefits that's not going to uh, run out of town, uh, prisons can look pretty good. If you've got just, uh, if you got, if you finished high school but uh, no college, it's a job you can get. And uh, uh, many people in corrections, I think, have been uh, in the military or, or in other security type positions. And it's not a big uh, stretch to move into that culture of, of prisons. And I think also as, as you get seniority, you get away from the stressful situations that a new jack has to endure every day. You, you get posted in a wall tower or on transportation detail. And, and it's the inmate contact that makes it so rough. Now, back, back here. Yes. I yeah. I've been involved with prison support since 72. Yeah. Uh, and we had discovered a Klan chapter that existed in Napanak Prison. Earl Schoolmaker was one of them. I mean, we had pictures of him with a sheet on and stuff. And I was visiting Dan Amaro to speak. And inmates told me not to stay in the hotel next to Dan Amaro because I might be, something might happen. And I read in a paper where something happened to somebody. I was speaking on the first Black Liberation Day. But of your knowledge, was there any Clavern or Klan or white supremacist group that existed in Sing Sing while you were there? Uh, I'll tell you, I had expected there would be since I know in California, Aryan Nations is, is a big deal and that there are Klan groups. 
I was unaware of that in Sing Sing. I, I don't think I ever saw a swastika on an inmate. Um, I'm talking about the guards. On the guards? Not that I was aware of, no. And I'd, I'd be... See the yeah. You know, I'd be surprised. Maybe it exists, but... You know, I think a guard who felt that way wouldn't want to work at Sing Sing. He'd, he'd want to go up north where there was all, all white people. I've also got to say that one of the ways that prisons can damage inmates is, is making them feel conspiracies against them. And uh, I was on a radio show this week where a former Attica inmate called up and asked if I'd heard about the... Uh, if I'd heard from other COs about the seven inmates secretly killed by officers uh, during the 70s, and I said, no, I never heard anything like that. But I've got to say, this is a. There, there are inmates who feel that the system can simply make them disappear and, and do away with them, and I, I don't think that's a reasonable fear. I, I can't imagine that happening, but it, well, the, the feeling is real. There was an inmate who was yeah, killed? Yeah. Mm. Mm. A teacher, a medic, you know, mm. African. Mm. Another question, maybe from this side. Yes, ma'am. Do you know what kinds of crimes were committed by the very first prisoners? By the very Sing first Sing? prisoners at, at Sing Sing? Yeah. The very first inmates to occupy the first prison? I imagine there's similar crimes to the ones today. Maybe not drugs, but... Uh, uh, Crimes. You don't think as many violent crimes? I do know that most of the uh, early inmate ac accounts were written by sort of white-collar criminals, forgers, particularly, who, uh, who were at Sing Sing. And, and it, was, it was a very, very rough place back then with uh, whippings administered by the officers and uh, many other uh, physical tortures. Uh, a man standing with a baseball cap. Yes, sir. You, find, you have a demeanor now that seems rather gentle. Did you find that you might have gotten a little callous uh, while you were working in the prison? And if, if you did, is that within everybody? I don't know if it happens to everybody. I think I did get uh, tougher and a little meaner. And, uh, you know, at the academy, our instructor said... Uh, he treated a, it's funny, the academy sort of modeled on a prison, so you're treated like inmates. You have to have a count every day, and uh, if, if you have infractions, you, there are punishments. And uh, our instructor said to us one day, don't mistake kindness, uh, don't mistake nice, oh, what's the phrase? Don't mistake, don't, thank you very much, don't mistake kindness for weakness. And when he said that to us, I thought, I bet that comes straight out of his prison work. And sure enough, um, it's true that uh, as an officer, you're, you know, you have discretionary power over inmates. There are many rules that govern a prison, and they can't all be enforced. And every officer decides which ones to enforce. And inmates will try to get on your good side in the hope sometimes that you won't enforce some of the ones they don't like. And... Uh, you find if you're nice, you get taken advantage of. And, um, and so it sort of turns you a little bit cynical about human nature. You start thinking everybody's got an angle, everybody's got some agenda they, they would like to um, pull over on you. And uh, at least that, you know, I can't speak for all officers. That's, that's how I felt. And I, I think I, it, overall it made me a, a bit more cynical. I'm glad I don't seem so rotten right now. But... Uh, <laughs> I think that that is a change I felt. Ma'am, uh, right behind... Uh, okay. The problem is the CO's fear of the inmates and then being targeted or challenged. How big a problem is a CO's fear of inmates? Well, that's an interesting question because, um, you know, prison's a fairly macho place. There's a lot of testosterone in a place like Sing Sing, and you don't uh, talk about fear very much. You don't acknowledge fear, and in, in a way that if you deny it, then you can somehow march bravely down a gallery uh, filled with inmates uh, who've hurt people. But uh, I think every officer's fear is sort of summed up in a story. I heard, I'd say, five different versions of it, Sing Sing, which is that an officer is uh, about to write up a ticket on an inmate who won't uh, cooperate, and the inmate says, you know, don't hassle me, CO. You don't want to. You don't want to tangle with me. You don't want to go there. Officer says, 
you know, get out of my face. Just be, be quiet. Give me your ID. Uh, you shouldn't have done this, this, and this. Next day, on the officer's desk, there's an envelope with a picture of his kids on the swing set. And I heard that story so many times. I think it's a sort of elemental CO fear that somehow an inmate will be with some sort of organizational ties can actually track down an officer outside of prison and, and, uh, and, and threaten him in some, some way like that. And I, I think it almost never happens. Uh, someone may be able to prove me wrong in here, but it's an officer's fear. So you don't want your family to be touched by prison at all, and inmates uh, come out of the real world and they have the money for drugs, they have the money to make a lot of things happen for themselves outside prison, and, uh, and that's kind of scary. Uh, yes, ma'am. I wonder, uh, how did you last there for nine months? Is that right? You were there for nine months? Oh, well, and I was there how about... How soon after you were there did you think that you wanted to maybe leave? About two days. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, nine months, I, you know, I can pat myself on the back and say I was very brave, but there are many people in this room who have spent years inside Sing Sing and other prisons, and, uh... And so, no, I don't think of myself as particularly daring or bold. I get all this credit because I'm a, a person who writes books and we don't have to go into prisons, but really, I, I don't... Uh... Oh, I think you were very oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe just a couple more questions. Yes, sir. While you were at Sing Sing, did you ever feel the need to talk about your experience and was there anybody who was able to understand what you were going through? Yeah, the, again, it's the question, was I ever able to talk about it and uh, was there anyone who would understand? And I told, uh, I don't know, probably fewer than 10 people that I was working this job and uh, I had a couple friends, I'd, I'd talk, tell about it, but it's such a peculiar environment. It's like you have to start from square one to explain to them what you're talking about. I mean, it takes an hour of explanation before they can figure out what you even mean. And, uh, and, and I, so I tended not to. And, and uh, my wife is a great counselor of mine and uh, wonderful to talk to about all my projects. But I've got to say, I didn't want, you know, some part of me thought, yeah, you should tell her. You should be candid about all this. But a part of me didn't want to bring it home and, and ruin her evening, you know, after she's had a hard day. I didn't want to do that, and uh, in retrospect, I, I should have more. Uh, but it, you can get into a bad habit of being tight-lipped about the whole thing, and I think that's that's a very common problem officers have. Uh, on the floor, in the in the middle. <laughs> I'm curious about the process of the writing of the book. I think about what it's like to go home at night from a facility. Were you writing a little bit each night? Were you writing down anecdotes? How, how, did, how did the actual writing process evolve for you? Yeah, the, the question is, how did the writing process evolve? And what I would do, I worked the day shift, so I'd um, leave Sing Sing at 3 p.m., I'd drive home, I'd sit down at my desk uh, before the kids saw me, and I would write down what my day was like, what had happened, and if I learned new words or if I heard, you know, inmates say things or whatever, I would, uh, <laughs> I'd write it all down and I'd just try to get it off my chest. And that became an important part of my transition, you know. And then after I uh, quit, I spent about four months in the New York Public Library reading about the history of, of Sing Sing and Austining. And there's a chapter in this book, a long chapter about the history, which is so amazing. Just such a such a fascinating history uh, that this town and the prison have. Uh, I hope everyone who lives around here uh, is aware of it. Um, and then I, then I went back to my notes and I went through and tried to just pick out the most interesting parts and uh, tried to build the thread of a story of my time in prison that had some of the elements of a story with some suspense and other characters and uh, maybe a few lessons learned at the end. Yes, sir, in the back. What kind of uniform do they wear? Because I, I know they're not supposed <coughs> to have shoelaces and, and belts like... You mean the inmates? Yeah, do they wear shower shoes and coveralls? Because <laughs> 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 
I I visited somebody in a jail and, and they weren't even allowed to wear shoes because they're like shoelaces you can hang yourself. No, until that, you can hit yeah. somebody. That that's only uh, people under psychiatric observation yeah. in the. Uh, in the psychiatric satellite unit that don't get shoelaces. Women there anymore? Is, are the conditions that poor that they don't want women there anymore? With, with female inmates, you mean? Yeah, didn't they used to in the old days? There was. For a while, there was a female prison there. I don't think it's because the conditions were bad. It's just the way that prisons were developed. In, women inmates are now at Bedford Hills and Taconic in, in Westchester. And uh, uh, it seems simpler that way. Somebody who hasn't answered, yes, ma'am, in the red hair. You mentioned earlier that some COs wrote to you thanking you for writing the first truthful thing about the job. Yeah. What was the reaction of the COs that you worked with on a daily basis at Sing Sing? Well, I've only heard from three so far, <laughs> and uh, the reaction has all been good. I'm not naive enough to think everybody's going to like the book, but um, uh, so far, so good. I've, I'm... I was thinking tonight, uh, <laughs> tonight could be the night. So far, so good. <laughs> yes, ma'am, over here. Well, I heard of your group. You said one prisoner asked you, what were you doing there? You, what was your game? I yeah, the, the, of... one inmate and one officer just thought there's something weird about me. Yeah. And uh, this inmate was so perceptive. Uh, he, he would watch me walking down the gallery and say, you're not like the other COs. I said, what are you talking about? I went to a wedding one night after work in, uh, over by Purdy's on the other side of Westchester. I brought a suit to work. I stayed up late. I was exhausted the next morning. I came to work. I'm walking down the gallery. This guy holds out his mirror, and as I come by, he says, Conover, how come you look like you're wearing a tuxedo? How come you walk like you're wearing a tuxedo today? I mean, try to explain that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know that you have become a lot of the roles that you have written your books about. The hobo, uh, living in Aspen, uh, being a taxi driver there, and so forth. Have you got, what are your plans for your new home? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is about the limit. I, I really, uh, I, this was a very, very hard uh, experience to have, and I don't feel I have to one-up myself anymore. I, I, I think I might just uh, take it easy for a while. Maybe, uh, yes, sir, in the corner. Uh, say the, uh, what's, 1800s, 1900s, what they did was they took their prison population and they created the colony of Australia. Yeah. Right? And so one way they dealt with their prison population was just to remove people so you couldn't see them. Yeah. Here in this country, we keep building more and more prisons, so you see this... Uh, presence and you have these citizens most of them who are now you know maybe healthier some of them they, they get their three squares they're taken care of it's very unfortunate and uh, but what do you think is going to happen I mean as we keep did you have any thoughts about looking ahead as more and more prisons I mean <laughs> tell them. it's yeah, going to get so them. you know <laughs> numerous and so you know well the, the question is what, what are we going to do you know England sent them to Australia uh, uh, if you look, if you look at the last 20 years of the prison population in the United States, the graph goes like this, and it's it's due mainly to the drug laws. And this is not sustainable. It, it can't continue like that. It's it's like the stock market. There's got to be a limit. It can't keep growing like that forever. And um, one wall we're going to hit is expense. It's hugely expensive to keep building and running so many prisons. And another wall is the social cost of so many people, one in every 140 Americans now, behind bars. And almost all of them are going to come out. And they're not going to come out better than they went in. Almost, almost nobody pretends that prisons rehabilitate anymore. Most of them are going to come out worse. Maybe some will be old enough that they're not going to commit crimes anymore. But most of them are going to be mad. And they're going to get in trouble again. And it's like... they're. I think that in the next couple of years, those who watch the news and, and follow prison issues are going to see this is going to start catching up with us, and we have to use some more imagination. I mean, Sing Sing is this amazing example of American ingenuity and, and creativity. It was one of the first penitentiaries. The Quakers had this idea. You don't put all the inmates together in a big room. You put them in separate cells. You probably know this. You give them a Bible. You don't let them talk. 
and through solitary reflection, through penitent reflection, this is the root of the word penitentiary, they will reform themselves. Well, it didn't really work out, but at least it was an idea. At least it was an attempt to not just separate, but turn them around. And, I mean, the idealism left American corrections for the most part in the 1970s, and we're just on this in insane binge of throwing people behind bars, and they're not getting better. So, um, I, I think that's a huge problem. And let me stop on that note. I would, uh, I, I'd like to stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, if, if people have more questions, I'm pretty good at answering email. Uh, my website's listed on the back flap of the book. If you email me, I'll try to write you back. It'll be hard to have more conversations just now. I'm going to sign books of those who uh, would like it. And just thanks so much for coming, especially for standing back there. Thank you.